Welcome to this movie on classical mechanics, which deals with normal modes. It is part of a series of movies I have made for my second year students, Classical Mechanics, a course which I teach at the Technical University of Delft, and my name is Jos Thesen. In this movie I want to analyze a system consisting of springs, two masses, one is uh, attached to a pendulum, and uh, I will show that if you perturb the system from its equilibrium slightly, it will uh, start oscillations, and these oscillations can be described as so-called normal modes. Uh, I also have made another movie in which I deal with the normal mode problem in a more formal way, and which give you, gives you a more general approach to the problem. But I guess this one will be a nice introduction to the second one. I hope you will learn a lot about this interesting topic's normal modes. We start by considering a system consisting of two springs with spring constant kappa, and they are connected to a mass which can only move in the horizontal direction. And on this mass, little m, there is suspended a pendulum which can rotate and the mass of the pendulum is m, and the length of the pe pendulum is l. And uh, we see that the system has two degrees of freedom, one corresponding to the horizontal motion of the little m, and one corresponding to the swing of the pendulum. And therefore we need two generalized coordinates, and for the first one we will use the horizontal displacement, which is the capital X, and then for the second degree of freedom. We will use the angle phi between the pendulum and the vertical. And so then it's a standard exercise to formulate the Lagrangian. We first know that the kinetic energy of little m is easy to find. That of the capital M is a little bit more tricky, but the exposition of the capital M can be written as the exposition of the little m, and then we have to add the horizontal displacement of the pendulum, as usual, L sine phi, and the vertical coordinate of M is minus L cosine phi. And so we can immediately find the time derivatives x dot and y dot and so then that those are the key to find the kinetic energy of the entire system. And this is found by as m times x dot squared over 2, and then we have capital M over 2, and then the horizontal and vertical velocities added as squares, and then if we streamline this, uh, equate this expression, then we find the total mass being the little mass and the capital mass, and they are both moving with uh, the x dot. And then we have the velocity of the pendulum, and then we have a term which couples the horizontal motion of the pendulum with the horizontal motion, capital X. So that is the kinetic energy, and the next we need to find is potential, and that consists of first the, kinet the potential energy of the two springs, and I have assumed here that the springs are in, in equilibrium when the mass is in, in the equilibrium position, so when it moves to the right it compresses one spring and uh, extends the other, and uh, if it moves to the left it stretches the right spring and it compresses the left spring. So we have two spring contributions, and that, that's why I don't have a kappa over 2x squared, but I have a kappa x squared. And then this is the usual term for a pendulum, the gravitational energy. We can combine the two into the Lagrangian, and that gives this long expression from which we can derive the equations of motion. First we write down the equation for capital X. Uh, I get, have here the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the X dot, and the first term here gives this simply this little m plus capital M x dot dot, but there is also an x dot over there, and if I take the derivative with respect to that and then put the total time derivative in front of that, this uh, phi dot cosine phi gives rise to two additional terms, and so here are all the terms collected together. 
and on the right hand side I have DL D capital X and that simply gives me a minus 2 kappa times X and so then we proceed with the equation for the phi and the equation for phi also has one term which is rather simple it's this one take the derivative with respect to the phi dot and then take an additional time derivative to yield the ml squared phi dot dot then there is a derivative with respect to phi dot coming from this term and leaving an ml times x dot cosine phi and so we have ml times the time derivative of x dot cosine phi which gives us two terms uh, this term where the x gets an, gets an extra dot and when we take the derivative with respect to that term we have a minus phi dot sine phi and this should be equal to dl d phi and there we should not forget uh, also this phi dependence in the kinetic energy so again we have two terms coming from the derivative of phi on the right hand side so if we then put the derivatives on the right hand side we can extract a factor of ml in front of the parentheses and there is a sine phi with both terms and this is the final form of the equation these equations can in principle be solved on a computer but analytical solution is uh, difficult if not impossible and so in such problems we usually uh, are not interested also in the full solution but what is an interesting case is when we are close to equilibrium so the system is in equilibrium when the mass little m is suspended precisely in the middle between the two walls the springs are identical and when the uh, pendulum is hanging completely vertically so that in that case the capital X and the phi are zero and then if we give a small kick to the system then we will have small excursions and we, assu we assume that the system will start to vibrate with a small amplitude in phi and in X and so therefore we now make the step to approximate the cosine phi and the sine phi by the small angle forms so uh, if the angle phi is small we can expand the cosine up to the second order it gives me 1 minus phi squared over 2 and the sine phi to first order the second order vanishes and that is what we are going to put into these equations and then we see whether we can make any progress so here that has been carried out so everywhere where there was a cosine phi like here I have replaced it by 1 minus phi squared over 2 and wherever I find a sine phi I replace it by a phi like here and by a phi like there which comes and derives from this term and so looking at these equations we see that there are terms which, con which contain higher powers of the phi's and the x's for example we have here a phi dot dot times a phi squared so that's third order in phi we have also terms that are linear in x and in phi and uh, in order because the angles and the x's are supposed to be small we only keep the terms that are linear in the x and the phi or their first or second order time derivatives and if we keep indeed only the terms that are linear in x or in phi or the time derivatives this is what we arrive at two equations linear in x x dot dot and phi dot dot and now we can solve these equations by using an ansatz and this ansatz consists of assuming that the x and the phi vibrate all with the same frequency and so we can either write the x and the phi as a cosine or a sine but here I've used the uh, exponential notation x is some amplitude x0 times x and e in the power i omega t and the same for phi so uh, being just a little bit more accurate I could put explicitly the time dependence on the left hand side but the amplitudes 
x0 and phi0, they obviously are time independent. So if we do that, then it turns out that the x dot dot, of course, gives us minus omega squared x, and the phi dot dot gives you minus omega squared phi, and you would find the same if you would choose for x or phi a sine or a cosine of omega t plus perhaps some offset face. If we now replace the x dot dot and the phi dot dot by respectively minus omega squared x and minus omega squared phi, then we find the following two equations where we have divided the second equation by L because that occurs in each term. And we have uh, now two linear equations in x0 and phi0, those are the amplitudes. You may ask where the uh, e to the power i omega t has gone. Well, each term contains, in fact, a factor of e to the power i omega t, this term, that term, that term, etc. And so I have divided that out from this equation in order to arrive at these two linear equations. And if we can solve those linear equations for x0, phi0 and omega squared, then we have found a solution to the equations of motion. In view of the uh, linearity of these two equations, it seems uh, useful to use a matrix notation. And indeed we can do that. I've done that here. You see that I can cast this equation, uh, these two equations into a matrix form, into a single matrix equation, which has two components, two components on the left and on the right hand side. And if we require that the first component on the left hand side is equal to that on the right hand side we obtain the first equation so minus omega squared m plus m times x zero is the first term ml times minus omega squared phi zero is the second term and on the right hand side we have minus two kappa x zero and we can check that the same holds true for the second line of the equation so we have now the equation omega squared m matrix phi vector is matrix k times psi vector. And what we search for is a non-zero vector psi and we search for values omega squared. And that's really reminiscent of what we do when we diagonalize a matrix. And when we diagonalize a matrix, then we search for a non-zero vector x which when acting upon that x with a, it gives me an eigenvalue lambda times x. So it's the eigenvalue lambda that we search for and these vectors, these eigenvectors x. And that's the same here. The omega squared can be viewed as an eigenvalue uh, and the uh, psi is the eigenvector, which in this case is x. There is, however, one difference. In this case, the lambda is multiplied by the unit matrix, and here it's multiplied by m. And m is, in general, not the unit matrix. So this is not a standard eigenvalue problem, and therefore we introduce the new term generalized eigenvalue problem. This is a generalized eigenvalue problem. So a generalized eigenvalue problem is a problem of this form, and the word generalized, the term generalized here, indicates that the m and the k are not equal to or proportional to the unit matrix. The solution to a generalized eigenvalue proceeds along the same lines as that of an ordinary eigenvalue problem. We put, we move the right hand, term on the right hand side to the left hand side, and then we arrive at omega squared matrix m minus matrix k acting on the vector psi should be zero and we want to, to obtain a non-trivial solution that is psi should not be the null vector and that is possible if and only if the determinant so that's indicated by these vertical lines the determinant of this matrix is zero so the determinant of this matrix is zero the m and the k are well known and so this equation gives me a polynomial equation in terms of omega squared. It's only omega squared which pops up as the unknown. So I've repeated here the matrices m and k and if we put them in the, into this equation we have a, a determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix which can be evaluated straightforwardly 
and we find this equation which we can then reduce to the following equation which is a quadratic equation in terms of the omega squared it can be solved straightforwardly and we get an omega 1 and an omega 2 and once we have those frequencies we can put them back into this equation and then we can solve for the two eigenvectors corresponding to omega 1 and omega 2 respectively. Now that procedure is a very straightforward but a little bit tedious mathematical exercise and uh, you're invited to go through the exercise and find the eigenvectors and the two frequencies omega 1 and omega 2. But uh, to conclude we see that we find two and they are called normal modes we find two solutions to the equations of motion which we have here reduced to a form by a simple linear form by requiring that the phi and the x and the time derivatives are small and we find therefore two frequencies together with two amplitudes as a solution to the generalized eigenvalue problem and because these equations are linear any solution can be written as a linear combination of the two eigen modes that we find, of the two normal modes that we find. The solutions are called normal modes. And what characterizes a normal mode is first of all its frequency and secondly its amplitude, so the x0 and the phi0. Those are the eigenvectors of the generalized eigenva uh, eigenvalue problem. And so we find two eigenvectors with two different frequencies. And one of those eigenvectors, with it, together with its own frequency, defines a normal mode. So we have seen that the dynamics of the system close to equilibrium can be, de can be found in terms of normal modes. And now you may think that these normal modes are just particular solutions to the problem which uh, never arise. And in a sense that is true, but if we take a general motion close to equilibrium, then this motion can always be written as a linear combination of normal modes. And that is a direct result of the fact that the resulting equations that we have solved are linear equations. And so the superposition principle holds. Any linear combination of normal modes gives you, uh, again, a solution to the equations of motion. And that is, in fact, the use of normal modes. They form a kind of basis which allows us to understand the excitations of a system when it's close to its equilibrium situation.